right, super excited to be here in Hong Kong with uh, one and only Neil. Neil, welcome to the Robert Show again. It's super uh, good to see you in Hong Kong, and uh, I couldn't miss this opportunity where I wanted to talk so much about data security, what's happening in, at Yellow Brick, and much more. So, just for our audience, would you like to tell us what's happening at Yellow Brick, and uh, would love to chat a little about data security today? Yeah, sure. And thanks for uh, coming by and interrupting your uh, your vacation, especially after a long flight as well. To, uh, to <laughs> <laughs> really, yeah. really appreciate it. So, thank um, you. No, at Yellow Brick, I think one of the most interesting things that's happened for us in the last really month or two has been dealing with the aftermath of a lot of the Snowflake data breaches. And yep. you know, as you know, it wasn't Snowflake themselves that were breached, but a lot of Snowflake customers that were affected. True, true. And you know, just on that point itself, I've read about the data breaches of Snowflake customers. It was something about like 165 companies affected uh, across many industries and obviously uh, sometimes it's being called the biggest data breach ever. So what exactly happened? Can you tell us more about it? Yeah, sure. So what happened was a bunch of, you know, bad actors got malware installed onto people's laptops. Mm -hmm. They ended up being able to harvest people's Snowflake credentials and passwords uh, for a number of users at their customers. Right. This meant that when you had those harvested credentials, you could access the customer's data in Snowflake. Mm -hmm. uh, the hackers took that access the data, downloaded a lot of the data, and started to sell it for ransom. And as you know, the customers were affected were, you know, Santander Bank, Ticketmaster, Globe Life Insurance, even a school district. The data contained personally identifying information, credit card numbers, bank balances, citizenship, all sorts of, you know, potentially really valuable stuff there for bad actors. Mm, okay, so yeah, that's something, you know, obviously, a very important thing for everyone out there in terms of the data. Uh, I have another question which is uh, obviously around securing, uh, securing the uh, data. So what does that mean for companies securing data with them and other cloud providers? The shared responsibility model for security has largely been uh, accepted, but is there any problem with that? Would you like to share something around that? It's actually a really complex landscape. Uh, mm -hmm. The landscape is getting more and more complex in terms of how to secure these environments. So first of all, when you look at enterprise data environments, you've got hundreds or thousands of users of the data. Right. And the whole trend that we had towards citizen data science and more use of data meant we wanted even more users. Yeah. And every one of those users has some laptop or machine that's a potential vulnerability. So yes. I think that's the first trend. Um, the second trend has been, you know, moving everything to the cloud was super easy at the end mm -hmm. of the day. And so you know, a lot of customers move things very, very quickly without perhaps giving as much attention to security as they could. Yeah. So you look in this leak, for example, PII, sort of the really valuable personally identifying information like social security numbers, mm -hmm. or bank account details or something like that, yep. really should have been secured and encrypted in a way that users couldn't see that data at all. Yep. The only people that should have been able to retrieve that would have been real legitimate end users accessing it via a web application. So clearly there were some lax security practices there. The whole shared security thing gets very interesting because Snowflake immediately comes out and says, well, it wasn't us that was breached, it was our customers, so it's not our problem, right? And mm -hmm. when you do all the training in cloud providers and cloud security, you'll realize that every infrastructure vendor or SaaS center has a limit up to which their security applies, which they call the shared responsibility model. Right. So AWS, for example, will secure their data centers. They'll make sure someone can't drive a truck through the door and steal the hard drives. And even if they do, that the data is encrypted. They'll patch their own services. They'll make sure the network routers don't get hacked. But everything above that is the customer's own problem. Yeah. And what you'll often find now in a lot of companies when you talk about security, they're like, ah, oh, no. It's in the cloud, security isn't a problem. Right. We trust Amazon much more than we trust our own security people. Right. Or we trust Snowflake much more than we trust our own security or something like that. But that's really brushing over the key issues, which mm -hmm. is those vendors are protecting against threats at the very lowest levels of the stack. But most of the attacks actually happen much higher up in the stack. And as a customer of these data services or cloud companies, that's still very much your problem. And I think we've generally turned a blind eye to that in the industry. Okay, that's something uh, pretty insightful. Thanks for sharing that, Neil. One quick question. I obviously talk to a lot of enterprise leaders and they kind of also have like a lot of challenges that they talk about. So, uh, you know, one particular question that I had for you was why is it hard to secure enterprise data platforms when modernizing and moving to the cloud? Any thoughts, any solutions, any, uh, you know, anything that you can share that would help the enterprise leaders out there? 
it really comes down to those enterprise data platforms and what services they're using at the end of the day. Right. If you look at really traditional enterprises, I mean, they've got probably one or two decades of infrastructure, sometimes even more that they've built up that comprises yep. where data comes from. Some of our customers have data warehouses that source data from over 2,000 OLTP databases. Yeah. Some have 10,000 users with 30 different clients and custom written applications and everything else, right? So it's very easy to come out and blame these customers on one hand and say, oh, well, you should have used MFA. But when you're dealing with 10, 20 year old applications that are taking data from the mainframe, mm -hmm. you know, the mainframe doesn't have an iPhone, it can't do face ID, it can't really use MFA properly. So when we look at the whole historic best practices of securing these very complex environments, the way it would work would be something like, you know, a city in the old days, right? You'd build a moat around the city, you'd have one bridge or door that was the way in or out, right. and you know, that's defended by loads of guards and guns facing down and crocodiles in the water and everything else. And it's really hard to get in and out. That would be the old world of, you know, VPNs and securing the enterprise environments and networks. Mm. And when we look at our most secure customers in payments and financial services in the cloud, that's exactly how they secure their cloud services as well. You have to connect to the cloud using VPNs that authenticate mm -hmm. preferably without passwords, with certificates and biometrics only. Right. Uh, when you do that, there are things called honeypots in there, which means if an attacker gets in, hopefully they'll get lured into the honeypot instead of the real service. Okay. Yeah. All of this sort of stuff, which were the practices that people used to use on premises, they now use in the cloud. cloud. But if I'm going and building a SaaS application in a hurry, I'll just go buy a SaaS service for this, that, the other, 20 others, stitch them together, put the credentials in there, build up this web of stuff, and now I've got 20 different doors into my world, not just one door at the end of the day. Right. And furthermore, each one of those doors is secured by someone else up to a degree, not by me. Mm. So it gets very, very complicated. So I think for companies where they have PII data or their data is really valuable, we have to see a shift back to implementing proper security practices um, that you know, right now is really only the most secure financial institutions use. I think far more companies have to adopt that. Those are great insights. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, I have a quick question for you. What's happening at uh, next at Yellow Break in the next three to six months? What can we expect? Uh, how are you looking at data security and privacy? Yeah, no, clearly a lot of the discussions we're having now with customers and prospects are around data privacy and security. Right. Uh, we have an architecture we call Private Data Cloud that lends itself to doing really well here because all our software runs in the customer's cloud environment and we really encourage our customers to secure that well. Mm -hmm. We'll make sure they have whitelists and VPNs and other things in place right. before they even get started with Yellow Brick normally. So that's the first thing. The second thing would be customers are starting to wonder, well, maybe it's not such a good idea to have all my data in the same place as everybody else because that kind of paints a target on my back for hackers at the end of the day, for bad actors, that you know, if I'm part of this treasure vault of really valuable data, maybe I don't want to have my data in the same vault maybe I want to keep it somewhere else as well. Mm. So those are what I would say are the two types of discussions we're having at the moment, and it's re leading to some really interesting business opportunities. Fantastic, thanks for sharing those insights. Uh, but once again, Neil, uh, it is such a pleasure to host you here uh, in Hong Kong, and uh, thanks for taking the time out. I can't wait to do uh, keep the conversation going and uh, last time we met in Mountain View, this time in Hong Kong. Who maybe knows next, where next, yeah? Next would be maybe London. Perhaps, yep, you'd be right? welcome to visit. Alright, All appreciate right. it. Have Such a wonderful a holiday. To you. Thank you. Thank you.